All right. If you got your Bibles or your phones, whichever the case may be, grab them. Let's go to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. I'm going to go ahead and read the whole chapter. It's 11 verses. It says this, After this I looked, and behold, a door was standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard speaking to me sounded like a trumpet, and it said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had an appearance of jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of emerald. Around the throne were twenty-four elders, and seated on the thrones were twenty-four elders. They were clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their head, and from the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to Him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before Him who is seated on the throne and worship Him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are You, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For You created all things, and by Your will they existed and they were created. Now just before I I, I start this tonight, if you had to guess what the um, main topic of this chapter in Revelation is about, what would you say? There you go. Now why would you say that the throne is what we're talking about here in this chapter? Because everything is about the throne the one seated on the throne, what is around the throne, what's over the throne, what's before the throne. And everything centers on the throne that is in... Where is it at? He said, come up here. And where is He coming up to? The door standing open and where? In heaven. So we're talking about a journey to heaven, right? And we're talking about a journey to a specific place in heaven. Namely the throne room of heaven, correct? So we're not talking about walking down the street and seeing your mansion here. We're not going talking about walking down the street and seeing your loved ones, even though all those things are going to be in heaven, correct? But we're talking about the throne room of heaven right now, all right? And what typically takes place in front of a throne? Worship, all right? What else takes place in front of a throne? Judgment. All right? And so what you're going to see in this is both of those. You're going to see worship, and then coming up in chapter 6, you're going and at the end of chapter 4 into chapter 5 is all about the worship around the throne. All right? The worship in heaven. When you get to chapter 6, the judgment begins. And so what you're going to see happening here in Revelation chapter 4 is a picture of of God getting ready for judgment. That God is ready to judge right now in heaven as He sits on His throne. Now, in order to understand the outline of Revelation, hold your place in chapter 4, 
and go back to Revelation chapter 1, and I want you to look at verse 19. Revelation chapter 1, verse 19. And this is what Jesus told John. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen. The th- write those that are, and the things that are to take place when? After this. So here is the outline of Revelation one more time because we're moving into the third part of Revelation to really understand it. The first part of Revelation is simply chapter 1. It is the things that He has seen. In other words, what we have in chapter 1, when you read it, you have John's vision of Jesus, what He has seen right then, right there. And he records it. And then the next thing he tells him to write is to write those things that are. And then what we have is Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 are the condition of the churches. The first thing he sees in chapter 1 is he sees Jesus. And where is Jesus at in chapter 1? What's He doing? Walking through the churches, right? And then chapters 2 and chapter 3, we have His letter to the churches that are the results of Jesus' inspection. And so as Jesus walks through the churches in chapter 1, He moves into chapter 2 and He says, okay, now I want you to write the things that are. And here are the things that are. This church has this condition. This is what it needs to do. This church has this condition. This is what it needs to do. And he goes through all the conditions of the churches. And at the end of every church, he says, if anyone has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to who? The churches. So he moves from a single church to the end of every church saying, this goes out to all the churches. Basically, he's saying, if the shoe fits, you better wear it. And then you need to figure out what you do with it when you put it on. All right. And so we have that going through chapters 2 and 3. Now when we get to chapter 4, go back with me to chapter 4, and look what he says again in verse 1. He says, after this I looked. Now notice the first two words is simply after this. And he told John to write the last part of the letter, write the things that are to take place after this. So after this, I looked, and behold, a door was standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard speaking to me was like a trumpet, and it said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. So there again, there is the proof that this is the third part of the outline so that you can understand what he's doing in Revelation. This is what I saw. This is the result of what I saw and what's taking place and what is right now. And this is what is going to take place after the church age. All right. Now it's pretty important to note that the word in which we get church today is no is not mentioned again after chapter 3. It is not mentioned again until I think Revelation 21 or 22, somewhere around in there. And so it is interesting to note that because there are many that believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. Basically meaning that before the tribulation of God comes, the church is taken out of the way. And the reason being is because if you were here for the message and when we studied who is Israel, do you all remember that? When we studied who is Israel? And do you remember that basically God has hardened the hearts of Israel and blinded the eyes and He's put a partial hardening and a partial blinding on the ethnic Israel right now until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. And then... He is going to remove the blindness. He's going to remove the hardness. And He is going to once again minister to the ethnic Israel. And you can find that in Romans chapter 11 if you want to go back and read that for yourself. But basically what we have here is that after the church age, we believe that the church is raptured out. And there are other verses that allude to that as well. 1 Thessalonians chapter 
4, I believe, is one of them. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is another place that you can go. But there are various scriptures that actually uh, help us to understand that God is going to take the church out, both the ones that have already died and the ones that are still alive. And so the Bible says that we're not going to precede those who have fallen asleep or have died, but instead, in the twinkling of an eye, the graves are going to burst open, and then we are going to leave these bodies behind, and we are going to go to receive our new bodies during that time. And again, that's just a, a teaching of the rapture from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 11 through on, I believe, and then 1 Corinthians chapter 15, somewhere toward the end of that chapter. You can find that in both of those places. But what we have right here is basically the church age is over, the church has been raptured out, and now we have to say, okay, well if the church is gone, how is anybody else going to be saved? Huh? That's exactly right. Through the 144,000 Jews, through the two witnesses, through the angel. Uh, in, we'll get there in, later on in Revelation. You'll study all these things. But I at least want to give you a mental note of it right now before we get there so that as we track along, you can go, there it is. Okay, I see it. Alright, and so here we have an invitation to John. And God says, here's what is going to take place after the church age. So once the church age is over, the rapture has taken place, this is what's going to take place. The first, the first voice that he heard from this open door in heaven, he looked up, there's an open door, and he hears a voice that sounds like a trumpet. Now this is important, because there have been many people over the ages that have said they have made visits to heaven. Books have been written on it. And don't we love to hear an account like that? I mean, let's just be honest. We love to hear an account like that. We love for somebody to tell us about something that we've never seen before, all right? But the truth of the matter is, very few of them, I believe, are actually true, if any of them, just to be honest with you. And I will tell you why. Because the accounts of the people that did get to go to heaven that we have proof of in the Word of God, their accounts all match up. I'm talking about almost identically. Whether you go back to Exodus chapter 20 and you see where Moses got to see into the throne room of God, or whether you go to um, Ezekiel, I believe it is. Let me see if I can find where that is exactly so that you can look at it for yourself. Um, Ezekiel chapter... 1 verse 26 and on, um, Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1. Um, and so there are several places that you can go to and you can see where people were invited to come up into heaven and see something. And most of the time it was this throne room that they got to go up and see. You remember Isaiah chapter 6? I've preached on it many times. He said, uh, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne high and lifted up, and the train of His robe filled the temple. Do you remember the vision that Isaiah had? Or if you go back to, Isaiah, um, to Ezekiel chapter 1, you see Ezekiel had the same vision and he describes the throne. He describes the colors around the throne. He describes the, uh, the bow of God around the throne. They describe the pavement that God walks on as crystal clear pavement. They, de they, they, they all have the descriptions of this trip to heaven that are generally the same. Not to mention the fact that Paul mentions that getting called up unto the third heavens. Y'all remember that? Um, I think that's 2 Corinthians chapter 12 maybe, or 1 Corinthians chapter 12, one of those two. But Paul gets an invitation to the third heavens, and you remember what Paul said about it? How did Paul describe it? Hold your place here and go with me. Let me see where it's at first. It's either 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians 12. Take me just... That's correct. That's correct. Well, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. starting in verse um, 2.
He says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Now here's what the Jews believed. They understood the first heaven to be the sky that you see right here where the birds fly. They understood the second heaven to be the universe where the stars and the planets abide. And then they understood the third heaven to be outside of that, which we have never seen outside of that. But they understood that the third heaven to be outside of that where God resided. And so basically Paul is saying here, I was called up to the place where God resides, to the throne room, if you will. All right, And notice what he says next. He says, uh, whether it was in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise, again, where God resides. Whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. And he heard things that what? <laughs> which man may not utter. And so here's the point that I'm trying to make in this. The only people that ever got to tell us what they saw in heaven are the people that God said and told them, write it down. Write down what you see. Paul, on the other hand, God didn't tell him to write it down, but instead he said, I heard things and I saw things that I can't even tell you about. I can't even say anything about it. Undescribable. Do you remember what he said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians? He said, I hath not seen, ear hath not heard, and it's never even entered into the imagination of man, the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those who love Him. And I believe he could have been talking about that from a perspective. Remember, he wrote 2 Corinthians 14 years after this vision happened. So when he wrote 1 Corinthians, he still had the same experience and understanding. And so it is very likely that in 1 Corinthians, whenever he said that, he was speaking to the fact that the things he saw, I can't even tell you about it. The things I heard, I can't even tell you about it. It's never even entered into your imagination, the things that God has prepared for those who love Him. I believe Paul was speaking from a personal experience, but not able to tell you because there are no words. And so all these people that say they were called up to heaven and that they, they, they saw God and they talked to Jesus and they saw their mansion and they saw their blessings, the truth of the matter is I struggle with that. And the reason I struggle with that is because, number one, none of the other heavenly accounts that people were called up saw anything like that. Number two, the other man who didn't describe it said, I can't describe it. Y'all see what I'm talking about? So here we have a, a man that tells us that I was caught up to heaven and the voice that I heard sounded like a trumpet. And now this lines up with the same thing that we see back in Exodus with Moses, same thing we see with the Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter, I think it's chapter 1 where it's at. But anyway, the voice of God usually sounded like a trumpet blast or sometimes it's described as a, as a loud thunder that takes place. But that it is, this is a very accurate description that lines up with everything else that said about the voice of God Himself. And this voice says to John, come up here. <laughs> He's invited. Come on up. Now, I can't help but laugh at this just a little bit. I don't know if y'all find any humor in it or not, but I mean, you think about it. You're sitting down here. Now, first off, do you have wings? There's a door standing open in heaven and the voice says to you, Hey, come on up. Okay. <laughs> and so we don't know exactly what took place here or how this happened, but God says to him, Come up here and here's what I'll do. I'm going to show you what must take place after this. And there again, I believe he's talking about the church age. Once the church is gone... These are the things that are going to take place. All right. Now, verse 2. At once, so when this happened, here's what we know took place. At once, I was in the Spirit. And behold, a throne stood in heaven. So immediately, He's in heaven. Now this is pretty, pretty special too, because um, 
When you think about a, um, the, the way the Jews understood the heavens, you have the first heaven, the sky, the second heaven, the universe, and then the third heaven after that. Well, here's what we know from science. Science tells us that the observable universe... Now, what does observable mean? It means that's just what we can see, right? We're not talking about the part that we can't see. We're talking about just what we're able to see with the technology we have. And they say, this was several years ago, it's probably changed since then, but they said it was 13.8 billion light years from one side of the observable universe to the other. Now just to put that in context, here's what a light year is. If you could travel at 186,000 miles per second, not per hour, every second you could go 186,000 miles if you could travel that fast, it would still take you 13.8 billion years traveling at that speed to get from one side of the observable universe to the other. And that's just what you can see. Here, John sees a door standing open in heaven. Here's a voice that says, come up here. And next he says, immediately, I was in the Spirit and standing in the throne room of God. That fast. That fast. That's exactly right. And I'm glad Melinda said that in the twinkling of an eye. That brings that into a little bit more context, don't it? So at once I was in the Spirit and behold... A throne. That's the first thing that he points out when he's in heaven. He says, the first thing I saw, the throne. This is a magnificent throne. This is something like he's never seen before because his eyes are immediately drawn to this throne. He says, a throne stands in heaven. And as Isaiah told us in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, it was high and lifted up. And the train of His robe filled the throne room of God, filled the temple of God. And so that's the first thing, is we see a throne standing in heaven. What's the next thing we see? Next thing we see is the one that sits on this throne. And here are some things that we find out about the one that sits on the throne. Now notice in verse 3, And He who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian. Jasper was kind of like the... Um, it, it would have kind of been like a diamond, basically. And so it would have been a very clear jewel. And what happens when a light shines through a diamond? That's exactly right, all right? And so the one seated on the throne had a color about him that was like... Jasper. He had the appearance. Now, he's not saying he was Jasper because Ezekiel tells us in the same context here that he had the image of a son of man. That literally, he looked like a human being, but his appearance was like Jasper. And then, and just for context, if you'll look at Revelation chapter 21, verse 11, look at that real quick so that you can see where I get this information from. Because again, one of the things I try to do in here is teach you how to study, and we're going to use Scripture to interpret Scripture. All right. So we want to find out what does this uh, jasper look like? Revelations 21 verse 11. There you go. There you go. Again, you can use Scripture to interpret Scripture. You don't always have to just sit back and think, well, I wonder what Jasper. And if you were to Google Jasper, you probably wouldn't get this right here. And so using the Bible to interpret it, we can see this is a very clear crystal that, that, that we have here. And that's what the appearance of, of God looks like to, um, to John here. All right, And then he says that he had the appearance of carnelian. Now this would have been like a... a um, like a ruby or a fiery red is what this would have looked like. And if you want to look at Ezekiel chapter 1, I want to show you how, some of the similarities here. So go back to Ezekiel. 
to use Scripture to interpret Scripture again. Ezekiel chapter 1, and we'll start in verse 26. So Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 26. All right. It says, And above the expanse over their heads, and he's talking about the living creatures that were around the throne right here. You've, we've skipped that in Ezekiel's vision, but that's what he's talking about. He says, over their heads, above the expanse, there was the likeness of a throne. An appearance like sapphire. Now there he describes the throne. We don't get that, um, that description from John, but we get it from Ezekiel. And seated above the likeness of a throne was a likeness with a human appearance. And upward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw as it were gleaming metal like the appearance of fire enclosed all around. Now remember, he had the appearance of, of jasper, right? Which was clear crystal, correct? And then he has the appearance of gleaming metal that comes, that extrudes from this, from his waist up. What's extruding from him outside of this crystal is what looks like a fire enclosed all around. And downward from what had the appearance of his waist I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire, and there was brightness all around him, like the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud on the day of rain. So was the appearance of the brightness all around. All right, so try to picture it. Now, I know this is impossible. All we can do is take the image and do the best we can with it. But you've got a throne that looks like sapphire, which is basically a, a blue color. And then you have, uh, we didn't get to read it in here, but we'll read it later, but you have the, the pavement that God walks on that's crystal clear. I think that's what they refer to as the crystal sea. It just looks like a sea and it's crystal clear that God walks on. All right. And then you have this um, appearance of, of a fiery red color like gleaming metal from His waist up, almost like a fire is enclosed all around. And then from his waist down, I don't remember. What did it say about that? Somebody tell me. Fire, all right? So the appearance of fire, and there was brightness all around him. So there we see that fiery red color that John was describing in Revelation. And then finally, here's where I believe the bow comes in, the rainbow. We see that in John's vision too. But where I believe is happening here is just like if you were to take this fiery red and wrap it inside of a diamond and it comes out, I would imagine that it looks like it's extruding colors and I would say that's basically what John is seeing right here is what takes place from that. Now go back with me to Revelation chapter 4 and I want you to keep going with me in verse 3. And he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. And so there again you have the same thing that, um, that Ezekiel said that he saw. And basically it looked like the bow in the clouds and it was putting off colors that looked like a rainbow in, in, in the sky. And so John says that's what he sees around here. Now that's interesting to me. And the reason I say it's interesting to me is because the last time the judgment and the wrath of God was poured out was during the flood. All right, And then what was the rainbow supposed to be? That's right. It was a promise. It was a sign of the covenant that He made with Noah and all creation. All the living, breathing things. He made a covenant and said, never again will I destroy every living thing in this way. And so I believe this is, this is just God's sign of the covenant, if you will, a reminder maybe, even though God don't need to be reminded, but in the, it serves as that sense or maybe a reminder to us that even though wrath is coming, it's not going to be in that way. And also maybe it's a reminder that in His wrath, He will remember mercy 
And He has remembered mercy with us. I'm just speculating here, but it could very well be any of these things. But here's one thing we know for certain. As we read this on, you're going to see that the reason why you have fiery red coming from Him and the reason why you have these colors all around Him, and you're going to see here in a minute that there's lightnings and thunders and peals of thunder is because the wrath of God is boiling up to a point that it's fixing to be poured out. All right, It's fixing to take place. Now go with me again to verse uh, 4, I believe it is. Or Yes. Now we go to around the throne as well, were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders. Now these elders were clothed in white garments. They had golden crowns on their head. And so there are two descriptions that we get there to help us understand um, who these people are. So there are 24 thrones, and there are 24 elders that are seated on the thrones. Somebody look at um, um, Revelation chapter 3, verse 5. Let's go back and I'll, I'll read them with you. Revelation chapter 3, verse 5. Notice the first part of this. And he's talking to the church here, remember? The one who conquers will be clothed thus in what? Okay, so that's a pretty good clue that maybe this is who we're looking at here, right? But let's keep going to see if we can find some more. Look at Revelation chapter 3, verse 18. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. So there again, the church has been promised that they will be clothed in white garments. Look at Revelation chapter 19, verse 7 and 8. <clears throat> Let us rejoice and exult and give Him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints." But there again, what you're seeing there is white garments that God has promised. And so the first thing we see, the only people in the Bible that are promised to be clothed in white garments are the church, are the ones that lived in this world and conquered by faith in the blood of Jesus Christ, and now they are clothed in white garments. Next thing you notice in Revelation chapter 4 is that they were clothed in white garments and they had golden crowns on their head. All right. So if you will, look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25. And it says, every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath or a crown, but we do it to receive an imperishable crown. And then you might remember, um, I, I'm not going to go to the Scripture but because it's very familiar to you. You remember when Paul was about to die and he said, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith, and finally there is what? A crown of righteousness. There are many places in the Word of God to where what is promised to the church and the ones who conquer are white garments and crowns. And so what we have here when you go to Revelation chapter, um, chapter 4 is you have 24 thrones and seated on the thrones were 24 elders. Now you also remember, if you were to go back, um, I didn't write this down, so I can't remember where it was at. But He promised them that you will sit on the throne and rule with Me. That was back in Revelation that we studied as well in one of the churches. And so basically what we have here is the promise of Christ being fulfilled to the church. Now we have to ask the question, where does the number 24 come from? Now, 
what we have here is basically a, a number that encompasses all Christians. And, and I'll show you how we can come to that, collu- uh, that conclusion. If you were to go with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 24 in the Old Testament... First Chronicles chapter 24. <clears throat> and this is where the, the Levitical priesthood is going to be um, is going to be represented by 24 heads, if you will, the entirety of the Levitical priesthood. And I'm not going to read all of it, but basically we'll start with um, Start in verse 4 of First Chronicles chapter 24. Since more chief men were found among the sons of Eleazar than among the sons of Ithamar, they organized them under sixteen heads of fathers' houses of the sons of Eliezer and eight of the sons of Ithamar. They divided them by lot all alike, for they were sacred officers and officers of God among both the sons of Eleazar and the sons of Ithamar. All right, now skip down with me to verse 7. And notice he says, the first lot fell to this guy, the second lot fell to this guy. Now skip down with me to verse um, 18. The 23rd lot fell to Delilah and the 24th to Maziah. These had as their appointed duty in their service to come into the house of the Lord according to the procedure established for them by Aaron their father. And so here's the point. The Levites, even though there were so many of them, they put them in divisions under heads of 24 heads. 24 elders, if you will. And that represented all of the Levites. So the number 24 was what David used to represent all of them. Now that alone is not enough for us to say, okay, that's what 24 represents. But go with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 25, the very next chapter. And I want you to notice that in verse 1, David and the chiefs of the service also set apart for the service the sons of Asaph and of Heman and of Jedidah who prophesied with lyres, with harps, and with cymbals. The list of those who did the work and of their duties was of the sons of Asaph, and then he goes and he names them out. But then if you'll skip down with me to verse... um, Where? 31? Yeah, that would be good enough. Um, Actually, look at verse 7 for just a minute. The number of them, along with their brothers, who were trained in singing to the Lord, all who were skillful, was 288. And they cast lots for their duties, small and great, teacher and pupil alike. Verse 9, the first lot fell for Asaph. And then skip down with me to verse uh, to verse 31. To the 24th, his sons and brothers, 12. And so again, here's the point that we get. Whenever they had a number that was larger than what they had duties for, if you will, they always they always squeezed this thing down to say, okay, these 24 are going to represent the whole. This lot does this, this lot does that, this lot does this. But we see that take place several times. And so we can basically say from this that that whenever we see this 24 elders and 24 thrones, and we know that from the promises of Jesus that they're wearing white garments and crowns on their head, and they're sitting on thrones, we know that that is the church, then we can we can definitively say that the 24 represents the church as a whole that that is basically lotted out in those 24 thrones, all right? And so what you have here is just basically in the throne room of God, the church has been raptured out of the world, right? And now they're sitting up here in the throne room waiting on the judgment to take place and we're sitting on the thrones with Jesus 
There are 24 of them, and we are in our lights of these 24 thrones in our white garments with our crowns on our heads, getting ready to judge with Jesus, if you will. All right, because the Scriptures teach us that as well. And then notice in verse 5 of of Revelation chapter 4. Next we have, From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. So that's what comes from the throne. (laughs) From the throne we have peals of thunder, lightning, flashings. And again, what you're seeing here is judgment is getting ready to take place. Judgment is fixing to pour out. All right, And then, notice at the end of verse 5, before the throne were burning seven torches of fire. So before the throne were burning seven torches of fire. And we don't have to interpret this because He tells us these seven torches of fire are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. Now again, when you go back to Ezekiel, we see that this was basically the floor that was being walked on. All right, We see that in Revelation 21, the Bible says that the sea is no more. Now I know we hear about, we sing about walking by the crystal sea, but go with me if you will to Revelation chapter 21. Let me find it real quick. Chapter 21 verse 1. Chapter 21 verse 1 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was what? No more. And so he's not literally seeing an ocean here. He's not literally seeing a sea. But if you were to look back with me again at Ephesians chapter 1, or not Ephesians, Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 22. I'm sorry we're flipping a lot, but... This is the only way you can really interpret this correctly is to understand that most of this has already been interpreted for us in other places in Scripture. And so we don't have to try to interpret it for ourselves. We don't have to say, well, this is what I think it is. We can go back to the Scripture and it's already been interpreted in some other place. So Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 22, let's look at, um, at his description. Over the heads of the living creatures there was the likeness of an expanse, shining like all-inspiring crystal, spread out above their heads. And then notice in verse 26, and above the expanse, talking about this crystal floor, right? Above the expanse, over the heads of the living creatures, there was what? So basically... John here is standing on the floor that God is that looks like a crystal sea. Ezekiel, on the other hand, is looking up through it. Y'all see the difference here? And so, but they're both describing the exact same thing that they see. All right. And that's important because, again, it, it ought to match up. I don't believe heaven changes from one minute to the next. I believe whatever it was when Ezekiel saw it, it's still that way. And John describes it exactly this way, just like Moses described it again in Exodus chapter 20. All right, so now... <clears throat> and, and you know what? Just for context, go to Exodus chapter 24. Exodus 24 verse 10. Actually, start up, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Um, start in verse 9. Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel went up, and they saw the God of Israel. There was under His feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for what? 
clearness. And so there again, no matter where you go in the Scriptures, they agree. This is what we saw. This is what it looked like. It looked like a throne. This is what His colors looked like. This is what was coming from the throne. This is what was around the throne. This is what was beneath the throne. And so this is what we're seeing when we get to Revelation chapter 4. Now, go back with me to verse um, the end of verse 6. And around the throne... All right. So now we've moved from before the throne to around the throne. On each side of the throne are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an angel, like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. Now again, this lines up with what Ezekiel, with what Ezekiel saw. It lines up with what Isaiah saw in chapter 6. And what we have here are the caretakers of God's throne that are around His throne. And if you were to go back to Isaiah chapter 6 and read the first six verses of it, what you find is that whenever, it, whenever he sees God and Isaiah looks at himself and he goes, Woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of an unclean people. And he recognizes his sinfulness. And as a result of that, God tells the angel, he says, Go to the altar, get a coal of fire out of there and touch his lips. And the angel goes immediately, gets the coal of fire and comes back and touches Isaiah's lips. And God says to him, I've made you clean. You're no longer unclean. And so what we see is that no matter what God desires on the throne, these living creatures are there to worship Him all around Him. Because in Isaiah 6, you also remember that they cried to each other day and night, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. And now they've added to this and they were probably changing it up back then. But he said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. And again, this makes sense because in Matthew chapter 13, the angels are God's instruments in discharging His wrath. And so since judgment is about to take place, you see that these angels... Go with me to Matthew chapter 13, verse 49 and 50. Matthew 13, beginning in verse 49. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So who are going to be the instruments of God's wrath? The angels are. They are the ones that God sends out to open the seals and the angel goes and this takes place. They're the ones that blow the trumpets and this takes place. They're the ones that He says, hold back and don't harm this and this and this. The angels are the instruments of God's wrath. And here they are around His throne worshiping until that time comes to execute wrath. And they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. And then in verse 9, And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to Him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders, here we have the church, the 24 elders fall down before Him who is seated on the throne and they worship Him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying this, Worthy are You, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For You created all things, and by Your will they existed and were created. And ultimately what we have here is we see the judgment of God getting ready to take place. The church has just got here and they've received their position on their thrones. They've received their white garments. They've received their crowns. And then when they look at the living creatures and they see the one seated on the throne and they hear the worship coming from the four living creatures, all they can do is say, we don't deserve to be on these thrones. 
we don't deserve to have these crowns. And they get off their thrones and they get on their faces and they cast their crowns before the throne because you alone are worthy to receive glory and honor and blessing and power. And then what we have next week is chapter 5. And I want you to notice, if God is going to take out wrath on the earth, we got to figure out who has the right claim to the earth. Because remember, someone has usurped the right to rule on earth. Who? Satan has. And how did he do it? He led the man that God put here to have dominion on it into sin. And He caused mankind that's supposed to have dominion over all things here for the glory of God to follow Him instead. And so He stole the rightful heir, the throne to, to rule here on this earth. And so the question that has to be answered in chapter 5 is, who has the right to take the power back? Who has the right to, to, to come in and take reign over all things that are created? And that's where John, he's looking for this person and they're looking everywhere and they can't find anybody because no one is worthy. And he starts to weep and he starts to cry and an angel steps out and says, don't cry. Don't cry. Behold, the Lamb of God, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, He is worthy to open the scroll, to take the deed of the earth and open it up. And as He's opened up, He takes back rightfully what is His through the judgments that are going to take place in chapter 6 all the way through chapter 19. So next week you get to come in and you get to see a massive worship service take place as Jesus steps up to claim authority to say, I'm here to take it all back. I'm here to reclaim what is rightfully ours and we are going to reign together. We're going to defeat all evil. And then we see a worship service take place as we see the King arise to be the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords. And then after this worship service takes place, notice in verse in chapter 6, verse 1, Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. And when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. And out came another horse, bright red, and its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another. And he was given a great sword, and so on and so on. And what you see happen in chapter 6 is the wrath and the judgment of God unfolds as Jesus, the rightful heir, takes the deed to the earth and opens it up one seal at a time. And as each seal is broken, He takes back what's His until we get to the end of Revelation when He's took it all back. And then we get to see the new heaven, the new earth, the new creation of God come down. And that's what we're going to do throughout the rest of it. So next week, study chapter 5. And um, and we're just going to see what I believe is the most beautiful worship service in all the Bible that there is. All right, is there any questions tonight? Yeah, um, yes and no. There is a quick answer because if we use Scripture to inst- interpret Scripture, I think it's in Isaiah chapter 11 maybe. Is that where it is? Basically, the seven spirits of God are... Um, let me find it. Chapter 2. So it's just one spirit, but basically the way they, they understand it is that it is, it is different characteristics of, of this spirit. Now, the reason I said yes, there's a quick answer, and no, there's not, is because this is just a guess, because this is the only place in Scripture that we have anything near an explanation that might explain it. Uh, the number seven is also known as the number of completion. And so 
it could just represent the entirety of the Spirit. Um, that So here is where we normally point to, but again, this is one of those things that we're not going to know for certain until we get there and see it and, we ex- and we're explained what it is. But most people lean to Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, where it says, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom, the Spirit of understanding, the Spirit of counsel, the Spirit of no- might, the spirit of the knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And so when you include the first one, the Spirit of the Lord, you have seven different ways that the Spirit is described there. Now that is the best answer that I can give you. Honestly, um, could be, could not be. But that's using Scripture to interpret Scripture. We believe that that is what it's pointing to. Any other questions? Any confusion? Does it make sense? And that's what I want you to be able to do. I'm hoping you can see the book of Revelation and understand that it's really not that difficult to interpret if you know where to look. If you just know how to search key words out and figure out other where, where this color is mentioned in other Scriptures or studying other visions of the throne rooms of God and just having a, a pretty good overview of the Bible, you, you, can, you can pretty well come to a pretty good interpretation of what's taking place here. <laughs> it ain't, no, that's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> you got that right because it didn't take him 13.8 billion years to get there, did he? <laughs> Amen. Well, and another thing that I take from this, since I always try to come up with an application, is this is a reminder because these things are going to take place after we're raptured out. But I believe it's a reminder to us that God is ready to judge right now. Because back before you were born, when Ezekiel saw Him, these same things were happening then. And then John describes it again, and we finally get to see it unfold in chapter 6 through on. And so we know that that's coming. And so one of the things that I'm reminded of is that I need to be reminded that God's ready to judge right now. And I need to make sure, make my call and my election sure, as Peter said. I need to examine myself to make sure I'm in the faith. I need to look and see that Jesus Christ is in me because I don't want to be on the other side of God's wrath. I want to be on the side that I'm on the throne with Him, getting ready to get off of it, to cast my crown before Him because I'm not worthy. All right. And so that's one, that's one application that we can take for it. And there are others, I'm sure, but now that you have a good understanding of it or a decent understanding of it, you should be able to go through it and say, okay, here's how this can apply to me. Here's something that I can take from it. Um, or it may just be something that you recognize His worthiness of praise and it just leads you to just praise Him a little bit tonight. I, I don't know. But there's, there's several applications that you can take from this. I promise you that. The what now? The time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We was at the ticket stand with fixing to our ticket to go from actually we were going to land in Parkinson. It was an hour difference. By the time we got on and so forth, we were waiting like four o'clock, we were getting in front of him at four two. You know, we lost <laughs> He'd come back and say, Whoa! <laughs> Whoa. And that, Took him two said, minutes. <laughs> Amen. All right. Well, thank you all so much for your time, your attention. I hope you learned something tonight, and uh, we'll come back next week. You don't want to miss next week. This is one of probably my favorite all-time study and 
subject to teach on is what we see next week. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I, I promise you, you'll really, you'll really get a lot out of it. You'll enjoy it.